All right, so as you may know, this, ev this event today, tonight aims to introduce us to a few DIY bio uh, communities around the world. And uh, tonight we have six speakers from different labs. One to Rachel Aronoff, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yeah, that's she's fine. Joining yeah. us, she's joining us from Switzerland to talk a bit about uh, aquarium. So, okay, I thought this was a great opportunity to put together a new little presentation, um, thinking about what are the real big goals of community labs in general, and um, also, of course, Hackwarium, we're a biohacking space um, that's been around over six years, and um, I guess next September will be the, the seventh year birthday party. <laughs> And uh, I've been president of the association for a couple of years now. We moved from uh, our old space where we had no rent to this new space where we're actually paying rent. So trying to be um, sustainable is a big issue for us too. Um, but basically um, I thought we would be able to talk about the goals and how we are trying to achieve them. But I thought I'd give you a little bit of background and especially talk about my work in the lab, but um, there's a lot of member projects that I won't have time to go into because we're only supposed to talk 10 minutes. But I wanted to start out really with this and say that we're really about open science and participatory research. And um, where we live, this name, aquarium, is really pronounced in the French manner, so aquarium. And this is really to emphasize our um, how we value transparency and um, sharing and we follow the whole code of ethics. Our hacks are solving problems, not creating them. And so we follow the DIY bio code. And um, it's really been quite a big change for me when I started out doing molecular microbiology, mainly in the academic world. And I found out about biohacking. I was just so impressed and it was really for my work. Um, we were doing a biosensor course for um, one of these big EU projects with lots of different partners. And with Aquarium, we made a course for people, um, also bio artists and people interested in pollution came to look at these bacterial biosensors for, um, for signs of pollution, like in water or in the environment. But actually I formed my own association called AGIR, Action for Genomic Integrity Through Research. Um, over seven years ago, before Hackwarium was even started. And when I heard about all this biohacking and so on, I said, wait a second, I'm going to do experiments for Azure at Hackwarium. And so this is sort of to give us the historical perspective. Of course, now with um, COVID-19, um, everything that sort of I plan to do with Azure, which um, I should say genomic integrity is meant to pull together all the dynamic molecular genetic details of cells into one big picture concept really for public health, to make people aware of risks to their DNA and especially the dynamic activities that like allow us to have a good immune response and things like that. Um, so at Hackwarium, I started to do experiments to open source DNA damage detection, but DNA is just a very small part of what I think of as genomic integrity. But um, now I'll talk more a bit about uh, Hackwarium in general and um, what are the big goals of this community lab. So we're really aiming to democratize research like many of you, I guess. Um, but of course, we're really into trying to have some fun and do lifelong learning. We've had people doing workshops that were nine years old. We've had, I don't think we've had any 99 year olds, but we do have someone who's quite elderly and retired. And I'm very happy that he got his vaccines already. So the idea is um, this sort of, with biology, we have fun, we have lifelong learning and sustainability. And then one big question is, how um, can we increase success of scientific communication in our world today? I think it's pretty obvious from the pandemic that science communication failed drastically, uh, that people still haven't decided it's right to wear a mask. It's crazy to me, but... Um, Anyway, I hope with this sort of um, opening up of um, 
the opportunities to be able to do research that um, people will learn more and, and then they'll understand more and then they'll be able to um, just do sensible common sense things, even though common sense isn't always so common. But anyway, the idea is that education should be very important for getting good um, reactions to scientific communication. But we've seen already that when people believe something, they don't necessarily, having more facts, don't necessarily make them change their minds. Um, they want a story, and a story is great, but um, I think um, having an open public space like this where people can try and use not just the tools of science, but scientific thinking right, will help us go a long way. And of course, getting sustainable and having better scientific communication are really big challenges, not just for open public labs, but on a global scale. And so how can you inspire people? Well. As I already said, I think this enabling of access to scientific tools isn't enough. Um, getting the right thinking of putting together an experiment where you change one thing and so you're comparing to a control situation is really essential. And so what I hope is that um, by having these sorts of open public labs, um, more people will um, will understand why uh, one week you can have one result reported by the media and a month later or something, there'll be something entirely different because there is no absolute proof. You can only disprove hypotheses with a, a good experiment, right? Um, so anyway, uh, this just shows one of the pictures of people at a meeting last fall at the lab. And actually on Wednesday in two nights, we have another big um, meeting and um, everyone's welcome to join in. We have even some members who don't live in Switzerland um, and having involved and motivated them is essential for this sort of thing to work. This uh, graph just shows some data from some of our water quality monitoring. So the big hypothesis is that hands-on transdisciplinary open science, you get people with all sorts of backgrounds together that's the way forward for better understanding and, and progress. We think opening barriers and providing opportunities to explore could really power successful innovations. Um, I know innovation can sometimes not be uh, mean exactly what people want it to mean, but um, I think that there are lots of ways that we can help solve problems in the world. And of course, we think of biohacking as that sort of fun mix of biology and technology. We're not talking about transhumanism or injecting your something in your leg to make your muscles bigger. We're talking about um, learning and enjoying things like, for instance, here, we were just testing with one of these heat sensors, um, how far a breath would go. Um, so there's a couple of members, Raphael and Tatiana, were doing that experiment. Um, before uh, the second wave, the tsunami of Corona came to us. But in addition to biology and technology, we're also very interested in the artistic side because we think that that helps really raise awareness. And this just shows Emanuela Ascari and some of her beautiful um, chromo tests where it's really looking at organic material in soil extracts. You can see in the background here, all the vials of duplicates of the soils that we treated with sodium hydroxide before making these circular chromatographs that are um, really, again, about um, the environment and having a good um, crops, good soil that will let crops grow. And we have a, an or, uh, urban gardening project also at Hacker. And so, Basically, we're always trying to do project-based explorations and members come with an idea, they talk about it, they bring in other people with different experiences. And so that's led to not just art, but music with our band, <laughs> Living Instruments, that has, um, I think there might be a picture later that shows the musophone and the, um, the organ of yeast that we use, or at least some of them. Then there was Beer Decoded that was very popular, our spectrophotometer project. There's one about open bioreactors too. I saw somebody mentioned that in the chat. Open insulin, we're finally getting some real data there, but we still have yet to try our first productions. The urban gardens I mentioned, it's actually with pea plants and the symbiotic bacteria 
for their roots and actually I have pieces germinating in the lab right now and the culture over there is the symbiotic bacteria. And then there are the moss menageries and the open food repo project, which is also very nice. Um, I guess I could show, I mean, this is just my moss one of my years ago, or maybe it's not gonna play. There was a video to play, but it's only three seconds and it just shows a water bear. <laughs> so we'll leave it out. Maybe I can show it later. But Barbara uh, said that I should mainly talk about my work. And actually, I mean, I could spend hours talking about genomic integrity, but my main project is about making a sort of cheek cell chip that will let us look for DNA damage in people's cells. And um, so we want to go from sort of hacked laboratory stuff to a really microfluidic device that'll let us, with the same um, sample of inner cheek cells, um, first get the micronucleus um, assay and then the comet cell assay to see how much DNA breakage there is. And we're also playing around with the moss menageries. There's a water bear down there. But the video, um, well, maybe I can show it at the end. But um, for the cheek cell chip, we started after um, going and learning about the open flexure microscope um, in Shenzhen, that maybe I could do fluorescence on that microscope to do the cheek cell. So here, here shows a comet. Um, with its little tail of that shows double-stranded breaks. I, I didn't say the micronucleus assay sh shows when a big piece of chromosome has broken off. So you actually have not just the nucleus, but a little micronucleus. But um, this open flexure scope, well, it looks pretty good and we've had some fun with it. So far, I've only seen with the fluorescence nuclear staining. So you can see this green here on the overlay. Um, and those are the nuclei of the cells, but actually we haven't seen comet tails yet. But then of course, everyone's life got a bit thrown over with the pandemic. And we've started focusing on some other things, but I really do plan to get back to these cheek cell chips. Um, and so how can we achieve these goals? So one of the main ways we've been trying to do this is this thing called do it together science, rather than the DIY bio, uh, where you can think about people in their basements and things like that. We think um, getting together these groups that are working together is a lot more fun and you can learn a lot more from it too. So this just is a picture of a biohack meetup that we had just before the pandemic with also Mark Dusselier and Frank Caro. Um, Mark is in Switzerland also in Zurich, part of the Hacteria Network and Fran lives in Madrid, although he also has spent some time in Shenzhen and is currently looking into going to do his um, master's and PhD in Paris, it sounds like, but um, with um, these people, just all sorts of things are always happening and we're learning new and um, exciting things. But one of the best ways to make sure that uh, things come out well, I think is this point about open documentation. So even if the experiment isn't, um, isn't entirely successful, you document it and you can look into our wiki on Hackware. And some of the things are quite funny and, um, it's, uh, it's a whole nother way of doing science. And I'm not really so, for me, it's hard to just watch somebody's video all the time, but um, being able to read it also get, lets you uh, sort of go through more and, and try it yourself. And so that's what we're trying to do quite a lot of. And in terms of materials and how we do things in the lab, well, whatever it takes is what we've done. Um, we try to upcycle old laboratory equipment. And even though, for instance, we don't have an ice machine here at the lab, you can always use dry lentil beans that have been in the minus 20 in, instead of chipped ice. So we, we do a little bit of fun hacking. And in terms of experiments and results, well, um, I guess I don't want to go too far over time um, because there are lots of other people that want to talk from these micronuclei. We've also been trying to get artificial intelligence to recognize the micronuclei. So we've been making masks and trying to train um, neural networks to do this. And then um, the real big project that we've been working on since the pandemic is with the group from um, just one giant lab, Jogel. We call it Corona Detective. And of course it was inspired by Guy Edelberg's GMO Detective. There he is. 
who did a bit of thesis defense today. And um, he did a workshop for us here. And this was actually an event that got canceled because of the pandemic. Um, but very nicely, we can very sensitively detect one copy per microliter of the reaction. It's a, a molecular amplification method, and we can do multiplexing. So we can detect not only the viral RNA, but also an internal control cellular RNA, and we can scale up to 96 well plates. And we hope this is gonna be used for surveillance screening because the vaccination, especially in Europe, is a bit lagging behind. But in addition to local activities, we've also had these amazing international collaborations like with Jogal for Corona Detective, also in Colombia, I had this great experience and another thing that had to get canceled. So we've had three online events about it um, with Mass Art, Mass Action. Um, the dream experiment was that we were going to do micronuclei assays on people who live in this Choco region of Colombia, where there's a lot of gold mining going on and the river's very contaminated with mercury. And there's, there's papers already about mercury leading to micronuclei. And so we were hoping we were going to get, you know, 100 kids in Bogota, 100 kids in Choco, and look at their inner cheek cells. Um, and this is, um, I really love this picture. Oh, no, I shouldn't do that. <laughs> um, she's just one of the people who does what we call bio gold mining, where she just goes out on her little raft and she digs without any mercury. And that's how your average um, person in that region might make ends meet at the end of the month by going out and looking for gold. And it's not so easy. And we also have dreams about doing things um, with our friend Vivek in Indonesia. Um, so I didn't want to go for too long, but it just in conclusion and um, for some discussion, uh, the nickname of the Hackerium members is Les Poulps. Uh, Poulp is an octopus. So of course, the, the big idea for Les Poulps is that we share not just knowledge, but also know-how. And we really would like to help enable important discussions for society and learn by doing. And um, another conclusion that is, I think, very important is that everyone should have access to a community lab. And so this just shows a few more pictures from the fifth birthday celebrations with um, in the middle here is Luke Henry, one of our co-founders, and this moss in the front is the mossophone from the Living Instruments Group. And this youth culture goes on um, the bubbles, go past a sensor, and that sets off the sound for the yeast organ. Um, this was from our lab warming party. This picture is the iGEM team last summer out in the back, and some key plants from our urban garden project. And if anybody else wants to join us, onboarding of new members is also part of the General Assembly meeting, which will happen on Wednesday. And thank you very much for your attention and for all the amazing inspiration from everyone and, um, and help also. This is just a few more pictures, a workshop, um, some of the interns that were working with me on the, the Comet Cell assays and an old Women's Day lunch we had just after we moved into this space. So happy International Women's Day to everyone, to everyone of any gender. <laughs> and um, I guess that's enough. Oh, this was also in case anybody wants to learn more about genomic integrity and uh, these uh, risks that are easily avoidable, go check out um, genomicintegrity.org. Thanks, Rachel. That was great. So I just want to say that if someone has any questions, please save them until the end because we'll have uh, space for discussion after all the presenters. So, Abby, are you ready to go next? So, um, I'm going to talk about BioMakeSpace uh, Cambridge, which is the biology lab at MakeSpace. Um, so, we're based in the UK. Um, as I said, when we were setting up, we are very much uh, a whole community organization. Uh, founded by volunteers. Uh, so we are very multidisciplinary. We take all sorts from your, you know, your, your experienced postdoc biologists uh, all the way through to, you know, people who haven't done biology since they were 12 or 14. 
Um, we really try and cater for everybody. We try and include people from an arts background, people from a tech and software background. And really the main thing that brings us together is that we want to do work and experimentation at the interface between biology and engineering. And a lot of how our space is set up and designed and the choices we've made in building our community uh, are designed at kind of facilitating the interaction between these two different groups, like people who have the engineering background, people who have the biology background. So we have a wet lab structure, and we also have a dry lab with prototyping spaces and soldering stations and 3D printers. We want, want to bring the kind of the two groups together. So we want to provide a supportive and safe environment. Uh, and like the previous uh, speaker, uh, we also like to be organized around projects. Um, rather than people going off and kind of coming in and doing their own thing. So we get a whole range. We, we do have people who are working on kind of kind of the more commercial and startup projects. Cambridge is a very kind of startup and innovation heavy city. Uh, we have a lot of people who come from uh, strong biology backgrounds who perhaps want to do a bit of work kind of outside of their main project that they don't have time for in their day jobs. Uh, we have people who just want to learn who who or um people who want to do a really specific project and i think the last important group is people who just want to help um we had a lot of people who came along who just want to build things uh, and just want to help bring the community together so that's kind of an important group of people to include and to make sure that we can use all of their skills as well uh, so this is the sorts of things we try and do uh i think the top particular engaging globally is something we're trying to do right now well, with this session. Um, so we try and cover a very broad range of uh, activities. Really, we want to both have people who are working on, you know, early proof of concepts, right way to people bringing in public engagement and trying to communicate the concepts of open science to a wider audience. We want to train people to use both our equipment and also to upskill and perhaps be able to change jobs. Uh, and we want people to just have fun, to just, just play around with it and, and make things. Uh, and do really curiosity driven research. So we have to ability to use. Uh, what does that lab space look like, you might ask? Uh, so this is a little mock up we did actually before we got into the space. It hasn't changed too much yet. Um, so we have a main wet lab where we keep all of our research grade equipment. Uh, we have, you know, PCR machines, key PCR machines, electrophoresis stations, um, microfront centrifuges, all the storage uh, and consumable stocks that we sell at a discount. Uh, then we've got like a laminar flow cabinet for doing tissue culture work and an autoclave in the next room along. Quite important. Also the minus 80 freezer, which has only broken once. Uh, anybody who's worked with a minus 80 knows how terrifying that is, but uh, we got through it. Um, and we also have the prototyping lab at the end, which I mentioned earlier is kind of our hardware space uh, so that we can work on open source hardware projects alongside the biologists and kind of inspire each other. So we have, yeah, so the, the top two, I think, is a little interesting contrast because the one on the left is kind of the new main lab when we'd first made it, before we'd filled it with all our stuff. And the, the one on the right is is nowadays when we filled it up with lots of equipment. Um, the, the one on the bottom right hand corner, uh, uh, bottom left hand corner is the pr prototyping space and the hardware space. And the one on the bottom right is our middle lab with our minus 80 and our uh, laminar flow hood, uh, it's tidier now. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of the inside of our setup. It's kind of quite compact. You can fit, uh, probably if you're working teams at benches, you can fit up to eight people in pairs in the main lab. You can get a couple in the, in the smaller kind of autoclave tissue culture room. Uh, and then you can kind of hot desk and do some hardware work with maybe four or five people in the in the end room. This is kind of at maximum capacity pre-COVID. Um, so what work can we actually do in our space? So obviously uh, we are regulated and we're, you know, there are some things that we choose to do and some things we choose not to do. So we're a containment level one lab, so no pathogens and, and no human cell lines and tissues. And we are GM work license so we do uh, genetically modified organisms work we take uh, our ethical responsibilities very seriously uh, i was pleased to hear earlier the diy bio uh, code of ethics get mentioned yep we are all for that too 
Um, and yeah, so we, we, we exclude uh, experiments with, which raise particular ethical issues uh, and generally try and avoid too much self-experimentation. We do have a lot of safety policies online. Uh, and this comes back to the point again about open documentation. We think this is really important as well. Um, they're freely available. If anybody wants to look at them and take inspiration for policies they might want to use if they're setting up a space or trying to expand a feature in their space, then we're all for it. Um, and yeah, as mentioned before, we try and operate very much around a project structure. And this also supports, you know, making sure we keep people safe and we understand what people are going to be doing. So what have we done? Um, we've been open for a few years now um, and we try and get involved in all these different areas. Uh, so we are now going all the way to Africa. Uh, Stefan Fadanka will talk to us about uh, his lab in Cameroon, Emboa Lab. Stefan, are you there? Hi everyone, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, my name is Stefan Fadanka. Um, I'm the executive director of the Mboa Lab and uh, also a research uh, manager based in Cameroon for Beneficial Bio. Uh, maybe we know more about uh, Beneficial Bio and, and the Mboa Lab uh, in the in next slides. So, uh, yeah, I'll just move. So, uh, Okay, sorry, I don't know what's happening. Oh no, okay. So about the Mboa Lab. So uh, the Mboa Lab is based in Cameroon in Africa, and it's a laboratory for social innovation and community community education. Uh, we are actually located within a village in the country. So it's really interesting. It offers uh, a very uh, special uh, working environment, and I, I really like it personally. And really, uh, the Mboa Lab, uh, I mean, the, about the vision, uh, we really advocate for uh, local sustainable development because the aim of the Mboa Lab is to catalyze local sustainable development through open science. And um, it's very important for us in our vision that this development uh, should be made or should come from the people that need the most, so the local communities. And, uh, and it, it's really showing in our work that um, uh, most of our work are really uh, solving specific issues within the local community. That's how we try to, to kind of work. And the lab was founded in 2018 by Dr. Thomas Mboa. And the, 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 the space, the Mboala space currently holds three departments. So we have the electromechanics department, uh, mostly that has to do with everything else uh, with uh, engineering, uh, artificial intelligence, all the software um, sciences. And we have the Mboala Biotech, which is the uh, DIY bio uh, and molecular biology and synthetic laboratory. And we also have the scholarly communication department. Um, yeah. So, as a background to the Mboa Lab Biotech, and uh, they really, it really started in 2019, though uh, the, the space was created in 2018, but uh, the real work started in 2019 with um, this, the establishment of the Mboa Lab Biotech, as you saw here, uh, the, the Biotech unit. And, and the launch of the open enzyme, uh, local open local enzyme manufacturing project, and uh, we are very uh, lucky in the sense that we had to, uh, to benefit from the extensive support of the Shetterwood Foundation, and also uh, the support for the Open Bio Economy Lab uh, led by Dr. Jenny Molloy, and now uh, Beneficial Bio. So. Uh, all this support enable us to quite achieve a, a certain number of things that I'm going to show in the next slide. Uh, yes, so just uh, to like to put a context, the Mboa Lab Baltic is currently the first enzyme man manufacturing uh, lab uh, ever to be created in Cameroon. And uh, as such, we've, we are raising a lot of interest from the local communities and and even from the government. 
and it's really interesting. So as I mentioned, the work at Guala Bank take mostly focus on the local production of enzymes. So what we try to do is to solve the issues that we face, like mostly uh, scientists uh, face that are dealing with molecular biology, is because personally, as uh, having a background in molecular biotechnology, I face a lot of issues to pursue my research work at the university. So having the opportunity to kind of address the same challenges I've been facing. We are talking here about the, the lack of reagents, the, the problem of accessing reagent equipment uh, is quite a serious problem. And that's why we really focus our effort on addressing it. And also, uh, yes, the capacity building, we are involved a lot in capacity building for uh, the next generation of researchers. So, and we do that through trainings, uh, workshops and other um, uh, activities. And also we are involved in research. We currently have some research funding uh, for the UK global, the GCRF funds for the development of a, for the a type free, um, CRISPR type free diets, which is um, a molecular biology method based on the CRISPR technology to, for the diagnosis of uh, typhoid fever. And uh, yes, we also have funding from Open Society Foundation and uh, the Bosnian Valley System. So uh, I will just try to talk a bit about what is happening uh, with respect to the specific point I mentioned about the local production of enzyme through and um, with the collaboration with uh, uh, Beneficial Bio, because the Mbuala Biotech is uh, the first bio manufacturing node for Beneficial Bio. So, uh, and the collaboration uh, has gone a long way to setting complete setup of uh, a whole research and uh, manufacturing unit uh, with even QAQC um, system in place. So basically what we do, we do a lot of research of R&Ds, still trying to solve the issue. So locally producing enzyme, uh, our focus now is um, DNA polymerases, mostly for molecular biology. And we do that, uh, we have the, the, the display, we have the, um, we have the, the technology, the current technology that we use is based on on the cell-based protein expression system, but we are investigating a lot about a cell-free system as well. And uh, yes, we follow the normal process for biomanufacturing using uh, E. coli cell, BL21, uh, IPG expression of using IPGG and then purification. So uh, trying to solve the issue because um, Access to reagent is a big problem, but at times, even when you have a reagent, it's difficult. Current, uh, considering our setting, we lack uh, most often access to uh, constant electricity. We often have power outages, and uh, so that's why we also work a lot on having the reagent that we produce uh, maybe stable at room temperature. And we investigated a lot of different techniques and methods, and currently we. We kind of have a, 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 a good system in place to have a enzyme in dried form, euphilized that can be rehydrated and used. So the enzyme are quite stable at room temperature. And uh, as biomanufacturing hub for beneficial, but we also work on the development on quite uh, some, some new products uh, that I'm sure you will hear uh, soon. Um, on, uh, on social media because we are about to do uh, some important release of new products. So uh, about the QAQC, basically we move, uh, we produce the enzyme and then we follow the, uh, the QAQC process to make sure that what we produce is actually up to standard. It's, it's, it can be used safely and uh, having compar comparable results as the commercial enzyme. So that's why we have the QAQC QAQC system in place, and uh, our QAQC manager Najin is 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 kind of is doing a lot of work to assure that uh, the system is 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 performing is working well. So, 
Uh, at Mbua Lab, we also uh, do a lot of uh, local ha hardware manufacturing still to try to solve the, the problem of access to reagent and equipment because uh, these are critical limiting factor uh, to do research in, in our setting. And uh, instead of, um, uh, of maybe having uh, equipment coming from abroad or uh, knowing the problems uh, about the custom and all the issues that were even worsened with the current situation with COVID-19. So we had the electromechanic department and we said, okay, let's try to uh, maybe uh, see what we can do in terms of the needs we have. So we went ahead and tried and started building some equipment uh, locally. So if you can you notice on this slide, the equipment are mostly related to molecular biology work. That's because we started by solving our own need and we are using the, the equipment uh, for the local production of the enzyme. So uh, on the screen, we have a GIY shaker incubator. Uh, we have the GIY desiccator and the microbiology incubator, uh, which is a project that was uh, co-developed with the uh, Mozilla Foundation, the B4 projects on GitHub. And yeah, we also have a vacuum uh, chamber. So all these equipment were developed locally uh, 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 with the help of the electromechanic department of the Mboa lab. Yeah. So uh, I mentioned that uh, we also do a lot of capacity building and we do that uh, to make sure the development that we are talking about, the local sustainable development is done and is addressing specific needs. And uh, we, it's, it's very important to make sure that the development can be sustainable. And for that, it's very important to train the next generation of researchers. So uh, the Mboa Lab Biotech, in collaboration with the Open Bioeconomy Lab, ran a, an internship training scheme. Uh, for hosting interns from local universities uh, in um, cutting edge uh, molecular biology techniques. So we are training them uh, on the synthetic biology notion, molecular biology, everything that has to do with what we were doing, local production of enzyme cloning. So it was a quite an interesting program for young uh, researchers and early career researchers and uh, at least six uh, students benefited from the program. And uh, yes, there's very, on the screen, we can have uh, some pictures of uh, uh, the interns working in the lab. So we also do a lot of uh, workshop. Uh, I mentioned that we are located in a village and uh, most often we have a feedback from the population and the community. So they are really interested in what we are doing. And at times, most often we organize some workshop to, to better explain and, and, and work together on what we can, uh, we can work, how and what we, we have to offer. Um, and then we do that through workshops and trainings. We organize a lot of work on the screen. We can have a 3D printing workshops and uh, some other workshop using uh, the public lab and the uh, aquarium equipment. So uh, it was quite interesting. And on the screen, <laughs> we also work a lot with uh, school children to really trigger the interest for science in general, uh, the passion for molecular biology, because it's something that really uh, is still, uh, that still needs to be known. So the, the, the limitation we have with lack of reagent access to, 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 the, to the needs and tools for the research is even affecting the general understanding and knowledge of about molecular biology. So there's also the, a, a huge work to do in how reach and then, um, yeah, so that's why it's very important to uh, organize such event with the local communities. And there's something that can be maybe a particularity uh, to the Mboa Lab uh, that we are trying and we advocate for a lot uh, amongst the problem uh, community based herbs in Africa face is uh, the lack of uh, recognition or even uh, yes recognition from the local authorities 
So at times the work you do, you do it on your own without any support. And it's kind of difficult. Uh, for example, also we've been lucky to have um, the Shoto Work Foundation and uh, the collaboration with the Open Bioeconomy Lab and Beneficial Bio. But without that, it would be very difficult to achieve uh, a certain objective. So we are trying to reverse that, to change that by uh, maybe promoting new modes of uh, collaborations within uh, between us, which are um, community-based innovation and, and and maybe governmental institutions. So on the screen here, we can see, and then is is maybe it's specific to our contest, but we we can use some Irish event to really touch uh, the local authorities. For example, here yeah, um we are explaining beneficial bios and Ebola work to the Ministry of Scientific Innovation, uh, Ministry of Scientific Research and Innovation of Cameroon. So is, is there are ways to really touch base with the people who decide the local authorities so that they know that we exist and how we can better collaborate. So we also do that by maybe uh, partnering, uh, looking for collaboration with some local universities and governmental institutions. Uh, yes, public and private universities as well. So the intern you saw earlier are, are coming from the Catholic University of Central Africa. So it's a whole process having for final goal that uh, the recognition of what we do about open science, that everyone should be involved. And yes, yeah, so it's, it's the approach we, we, we are trying to really advocate for uh, and Boala. So, um, yes, yeah, so I'll just stop here and, and I hope maybe there are some more questions. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'll be happy to answer to, to, to the questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stefan, for a great presentation. So, uh, now uh, from Africa, we can go all the way to uh, North America. I don't know, Beth. Uh, would you like to present next? Yeah, if I can go, I'll be super right. fast. Lightning, lightning. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so I have to, I have to tra travel in a few minutes. So apologies for, oops, excuse me for, uh, for the briefness. But I think a lot of the things that other folks have said are things that I would say too. We're a very interdisciplinary community. We're all about community engagement. We want to create space for people to make things. That's really like the heart and soul of all the things that we do at GenSpace. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Beth. I'm a molecular biologist by training, but I've been doing science education and community engagement work for the last um, 10 years of my career after graduate school. Um, so I do this work out of a deep, deep love and passion for equity and access for uh, emerging life sciences tech. Um, as many of the other spaces, we're a super quirky interdisciplinary space. We have high school students, designers, technologists, artists, um, computer engineers, and more. Um, we have age, you know, 12 to, tw to you know, 102 uh, participating in our programs. It's really an amazing space. Um, this is a photo of what our lab looks like. It's a fairly small footprint, but we're exploring opportunities to grow our physical space and potentially put in a biosafety level two um, facility. It's all kind of in the in the works, TBD, but right now we just work with critters that we know are safe. Um, this is our team. So we're an all women's team, very fitting on our, our women International Women's Day. So I'm proud of that. <laughs> Um, and then, like many of the other spaces, our program fits into kind of several buckets. We have interdisciplinary hands-on science classes, which we've transitioned to mainly online format for the duration of the pandemic, um, getting funky and creative with the ways that we can encourage people to do experimentation safely at home. Um, but pre-pandemic, we would teach people how to do CRISPR, how to do basic genetic engineering, biotech. Um, we work a lot with biomaterials and biodesign. And then, of course, we had smattering of youth-driven um, youth initiatives where, in, in fact, these are high school interns who are teaching their families and teachers how to science, um, which is pretty, pretty precious. Um, we have a membership program. So we have artists, designers, scientists, technologists, folks who come and use the lab as their lab. So this is a theater performer. Her name is Catherine Hamilton, and she does um, performance art. And she extracted DNA from the 60-year-old hat that she uses in a storytelling piece around um, themes of war, uh, trauma, and historical um, misuse of genetics and genetic information and, and um, 
in, throughout history. Um, hopefully many of you all are familiar with Opentrons. Opentrons is a, a lab automation company that is working on open source liquid handling robots, among other things. They got their start at GenSpace and now they're you know, a multi-billion dollar, or million dollar, excuse me, company um, working on pandemic testing and many, many other initiatives. Um, so these are some of the kind of things that have come out of GenSpace in terms of our membership program. A couple of other companies that we're incubating right now are Werewolf, which are trying to make sustainable fibers for fashion that are naturally colorful. Um, and then Vader Nanotechnologies, which is working on um, environmental remediation using directed evolution. So lots of cool things that are happening in our space. Um, and then we have community project teams. They're working on um, low cost, open source, accessible biotech. Um, they fall into a couple different buckets, but our bio design group in particular, I think is making some really beautiful uh, mixtures and textiles and patterns, um, thinking a lot about the materiality of living things and how we work that into our um, our sustainable future. So this is a, bo a bodice of a dress, excuse me, um, made out of bioplastic, which is really beautiful. I think it's really beautiful. <laughs> um, we also have a group working on open source, low cost hardware. And so they're building um, uh, DIY plant incubators. And this is our, a little video of plant uh, automated imaging capture. Um, so you can see it growing over the course of several days. And again, all of this is now built so that they can track it and um, quantify it and all sorts of other cool things. Um, we have youth programs. We have a high school internship program for 12 students each year. They come and they get a deep dive into biotech and then they um, present their research to their family, friends and community members. Um, we do school and community engagement. Um, so these are kids painting with bacteria, kind of standard things. We work with a lot of community-based organizations. And then we also do um, community outreach. So we'll have like crazy science experience. Thanks Beth, I'm sorry you had to rush. Um, let's move on to Scott Paunel, who's joining us from Canada. Yes, okay, I'll share my screen. <laughs> And it's actually a bit cold in the lab, so I've been shivering away here. But um, here, let's clear this up. The buttons are in the way. There we go. Uh, can people see? Yep. Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, so yes, uh, uh, today I'm going to talk about Open Science Network Society um, and the um, what we do. Um, so. Um, First, I love this quote, um, science is more like a mystery inviting anyone who is interested to become a detective and join in the fun. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of events uh, since our inception to um, engage the public, both um, adults as well as uh, younger folks. Uh, and we've done that a number of ways, but uh, I want to first give you an overview of the Kimi labs that are in Canada. Uh, so Open Science Network is the first one in in uh, Vancouver. Um, actually, this is from the DIYbio.org site, and it's not totally accurate. Um, there's a, a make space in Victoria, which is actually Canada's first community bio lab, and this uh, uh, Derek Jacoby that started that up. Uh, but I, you can see down at the bottom, there's the o Ottawa Biosciences, and Adrian is um, part of this um, uh, uh, discussion today. So maybe during the discussion after he could talk about that. Uh, but Brigo Bios in Montreal, DIY about Toronto. I don't think they're very active. And then there's Biotown in, in Ottawa as well, but I think they're not that active. Um, but Going on about Open Science Network, um, we were incorporated as a nonprofit, a BC incorporated nonprofit in June of 2015. Um, there was a meetup group called DIY Bio Vancouver started in 2010. Um, and so we've kind of uh, taken over that, rebranded as Open Science Network. Um, our community lab is located at Maker Labs, which is uh, Western Canada's premier makerspace. The, it's 26,000 square feet of um, makerspace. There's two floors. We're up on the upper floor, which is the, um, uh, uh, in inverted quotes, clean lab, clean area. Um, uh, so we're renting from them. Uh, and uh, this is the, um, the merry group of um, organizers that, that help get um, uh, 
Open Science Network off the ground, um, and many of them are still with us. Um, Michael Yamashita in the bottom right, he was the founder of the DIY Bio Vancouver uh, back in 2010, and he's still on our boards. Uh, 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 most people actually here are continuing on on our board. Wes, I'll get to the amazing stuff that he does in community engagement. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, everybody uh, kind of just helped to uh, found this uh, way back in 2015. Um, and why is my, oh, there it goes. Uh, so um, we do three main activities. So. Uh, the first is our STEM mentoring cafe. Then we've started up doing these things we call the science and maker jamboree. And these are kind of external to the community lab. It's uh, getting out into the community. And I'll talk a little bit more about them in a bit. And then here we have our community science lab. Um, and we do a wide range of things from workshops, talks, journal clubs. Uh, we've organized tours to the BC Genome Sequencing Center, 4D Labs, and a bunch of other uh, places um, uh, since our inception. Uh, we also run a number of uh, projects, and they, they kind of come and go depending on the interests of people. Uh, we've mentored students at the lab, and I run a synthetic biology class to um, uh, supporting members. So we've got um, uh, kind of two groups of members um, on Meetup. I think we have about 650 people um, uh, that are part of the Meetup community. And then they're what we call supporting members who are the people that actually pay um, a membership fee that allows us to rent the space and uh, do what we do. Um, so the STEM Mentoring Cafe, this is the brainchild of Wes Wong, and really um, it's about engaging youth uh, students to uh, consider STEM, so science, technology, engineering, mathematics, as a, um, um, a, a viable uh, thing that they can do. And uh, some people have described it as uh, speed dating for STEM. So we'll have a room where we'll have seven or eight tables. And at one table, there might be engineers. Another table might be geneticists. And it all depends on the mentors that we can get. And the, um, we're aiming for grade eight uh, middle school students uh, because often the older students have already decided where they want to go or what they want to do. Uh, whereas the middle school students, they're um, still trying to figure that out. And so the idea is to be able to get the kids to, in front of people who are actually made the decision and um, just have a conversation with them about uh, why you know, they chose that path and uh, to show the kids that it's not a linear path for most people. It's not like you know what you want to do when you're in grade eight, and that's what you do when you're an adult. So uh, we try to give that diversity. We also make sure that we have at least 50% of the mentors as women uh, to encourage more girls into STEM fields. Uh, and we've run uh, all girls STEM mentoring cafes, which are um, uh, really um, you know, for me, it's um, um, really inspiring to see how those conversations at the old girls STEM mentoring cafes are quite different from our mixed cohort uh, cafes. And, and it's, um, uh, it uh, gives me a lot of pleasure to um, give these girls that space and that opportunity to be able to explore the ideas. Um, so our science and maker jamboree, also um, uh, the brainchild of Wes Wong, uh, we had our first one uh, a, a few years back and we got a grant from um, Granville Island uh, to be able to run this. And it's basically getting a bunch of um, uh, science and maker organizations uh, to uh, come together on Granville Island and uh, people would, um, uh, just the general public, come scrolling, uh, uh, going through from table to table and engage with all sorts of activities that the different organizations put up. And um, it's been a very fruitful um, avenue for um, uh, engaging the public. Um, and then and at the community lab, um, we've done a variety of things. So these um, uh, two young women in, in lab coats, uh, they're um, uh, at, when this photo was taken, they're grade 12 students and now university students, uh, but they um, ended up getting uh, the top score for the Vancouver District Science Fair 
on their science project that they held here at the lab where they're taking silk cocoons and melting them down to um, uh, liquid silk and building um, uh, compostable bioplastics. Their goal is to try to create uh, prototype straws. And they largely did that. And um, uh, you know, they did an amazing job. And uh, since it is International Women's Day, they were written up in International Women's Day back in 2019 uh, in the local newspaper. Uh, and yeah, they're both now, one's in biomedical engineering, the other one's in mechanical engineering at the University of British Columbia. Um, and uh, yeah, you never know where community will take you. And so uh, for me, engaging at the lab, um, running the lab, um, uh, you know, way back in 2016, um, I was sponsored to actually take the How to Grow Almost Anything program. Um, directed by George Church and organized by David Kong. And from that, um, David, of course, is uh, famous for his Bio Summit. So he created the Global Community Bio Summit. And uh, I've been an organizer since um, the first one. Um, uh, this last year, I wasn't able to organize because of uh, my other work obligations. Uh, then also back in 2018, I first started engaging with free genes. Uh, and more recently, um, uh, the following year, um, uh, collaborating with uh, Jenny Malloy and the Open Bioeconomy Lab. And uh, I've engaged with uh, uh, their lab meetings um, uh, most uh, Friday mornings for me, evenings for them. Um, and that's been a, a very inspirational experience. Um, uh, so this is a Global Community Bio Summit. Um, if you're not aware of it, you should go and check it out, biosummit.org. Last year it was virtual, but the previous three years it was held at the MIT Media Lab. Um, and uh, this is one of the projects uh, with Jenny's group. Uh, uh, they're the creator of the Open Enzyme Collection. And so um, it's um, one of those things that uh, we've brought into the lab uh, and it's been very helpful. Uh, I've um, got a micro grant from the Just One Giant Lab Group uh, to be able to uh, work towards building um, open source and low cost um, uh, protein expression systems, uh, particularly for the diagnostics with the open COVID-19 initiative. Um, and I myself am work, have um, started this open yeast collection, which is um, a framework for metabolic engineering of um, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and it's expanded to picky as well. Um, and this is being synthesized right now at um, the Twist Biosciences through the BioBricks Foundation. Um, so it's funded by the BioBricks Foundation Free Genes Program, much like the Open Enzyme Collection was um, uh, partially. Um, and uh, this hopefully in a month or two, um, people will be able to order it and get it shipped to them for free. So if anybody in your local community labs are interested, um, uh, this is something that um, will be there. And there's actually, a, if you go to the BioSummit YouTube channel, you'll be able to dig out my workshop on the Open Yeast Collection. I think it's been recorded there. Um, so back in 2016, the Public Health Agency of Canada created this um, DIY Bio Summit, um, and uh, a number of us from community labs across Canada were flown there to, for this one-day symposia. Uh, it was repeated again last year, and it's quite interesting. That was in January of um, last year, uh, and the day that we were there was the first day that the World Health Organization was going to make a, um, uh, uh, a decision on whether, uh, an announcement of their decision whether or not coronavirus was a pandemic or not. And it turned, the Public Health Agency of Canada was hyperactivated about that. So, uh, but it turns out they decided, no, it's, um, uh, uh, we're waiting and seeing. So they didn't call it a pandemic on that day. That came, I think, a week or two later. Um, and of course, coronavirus has um, uh, impacted so many people, including our community lab. Um, we've had to shut down activities for most of it. Um, so I'll put up this um, uh, 
uh, slide if people want to um, have a look at it. But I thought what I'd do is I've attached a, um, I'm at the lab and um, what I'll do is stop screen sharing and um, uh, turn on my cameras. And what I can do is actually um, uh, switch over cameras to this guy and I can show you the lab since I'm here. Let's see, video wrong. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> so um, we're, I gotta unplug my laptop. Uh, so it's not a huge space and it's, we've actually expanded, um, we've almost grown by about um, two fifths. Um, it, it's large ceilings in this space. It's a, an old industrial building. Um, so we built some um, storage mezzanine up the top to be able to, um, add you know extra storage space we we pay rent for the floor space not for the storage space so that's free space um but we've got a variety of lab equipment uh, we've got benches um and of course we had a recent uh, donation last year of uh, an open trons uh so um there are people that are quite interested in that um uh, again more it's uh, more of a molecular biology lab um, more storage space up there and uh, we are a, a biosafety level one lab so we can do anything that you can do at your kitchen sink um, uh, and more uh, but uh, uh, we do have the equipment to be able to um, uh, run a um, uh, set up a biosafety level two lab but we don't have the resources for that um, Okay, so maybe I'll um, pass it on to the next speaker. I'll switch Thanks, my Scott, camera. for that tour, for your talk, and for that tour of the lab. <laughs> that was great. So it's, last, it, but not what? Well, sorry. <laughs> it, it sounds like it uh, is doing so. Uh, bio make space is fifty square meters. And that's that's about our size. Um, we're 550 square feet. So, um, but you know, it's we're not allowed to build formal walls because that would trigger city code stuff. And power-wise, it's a major problem. So the makerspace that we're in is a, a for-profit entity, and we're a non-profit. So that causes some catch-22s. They want people that uh, are working here to be members of their organization um, but we need members to pay for us and I can't expect my members to pay uh, uh, for both but um, make that's has been amazing we've been with them uh, a month after they moved into this building uh, so um, you know they, they've uh, uh, been soft on us in terms of their rules so yeah oh, that, that's amazing anyway uh, so I think we can move on to the next one. Last but not least, joining us from Brazil, we have Eduardo. Hello, do you hear me well? Yeah, so yes. let me share my screen then. And first of all, I must say you guys made some amazing presentations. Like I'm so happy to be part of it. Um, okay, let's see, do you see the presentation? Yes, okay. Yeah, yes. So, um, well, a little bit about myself before I start uh, sharing with you about BioLilo Lab. I'm finishing my undergrad studies at the University of Sao Paulo, so I cannot say like I have a master's in this or a PhD in that, uh, unlike many of you, I hope to get those titles eventually, by the way, uh, very eager to do so after college, but I'm still an undergrad. Uh, but even before college, I've been involved with uh, lots of initiatives, and uh, one of them is BioLilo Lab. Uh, I'm based in Sao Paulo in Brazil, and this is where we are located. So you see our slogan, uh, which is in Portuguese in the slide, is uh, bioprototyping or prototyping with purpose. 
um, and uh, the slogan for the slogan for Bio Little Lab is Bio Prototyping with Purpose, and that comes. Uh, from the fact that this is a very small independent lab we put together inside a much bigger space, which is a creative space here in Sao Paulo. And this creative space, which is called Lilo Zone, is actually a, a group of artists and designers. So there's people in this space that work with electronics and education and wearables and uh, prototyping and makers, so they have a maker space, they have a lot of structures for this, for digital fabrication. So prototyping was a key word. So when I uh, started putting together this lab with Lina Lopez, who is the runner of the place, uh, she said, why not bio prototyping? So let's use this wet lab to prototype biological stuff. So this is where the idea comes from. Um, Bio Little Lab is in fact a small, very small independent lab. And I stress that because I guess compared to some of the labs you guys have been showing, we are very small. We took part of this huge house where this, this creative space takes place. It was actually an old bathroom. So we repurposed everything and turned that into this small laboratory. Um, and I'm gonna show you a few more pictures so you're gonna get an idea, but it's in fact very small. We do not have like a minus 80, for example, but we do have PCRs, incubators, uh, which are not shown in these pictures, but we have incubators, uh, spectrophotometers, uh, but but I mean, mostly small equipment. Uh, as I was saying, it is part of Lilo Zone, this is studio, this creative space uh, that has experience in maker, in, in like different, different projects using digital fabrication and wearables and all of that. So, I met uh, some people from this space back in 2015. And since then we have been like flirting a lot and having ideas, flirting in the way that, mm, you guys are interested in biology and biomaterials, why don't we put together something? And then from this collaboration uh, that I built with artists and designers and people who are not scientists, this idea actually came to be. So for me, that's quite interesting because I was very interested in, in interacting with artists so it was amazing. And then we, we got resources from some, some researchers in universities who were like retiring. So they donated some equipment for us, like the incubators or the spectrophotometers. And then we started putting together, putting together the whole thing. Uh, so this is basically how we, it started. So like this picture, you see it's a small bench. Uh, there's a sink, uh, which is not in the picture. There's the fridge. There are some incubators and uh, behind. So, uh, there's a little more space than this that is shown in the picture, but this is pretty much it. Like it is in fact very small. Uh, but the, as I said, we do have stuff enough to put together some interesting projects as we have been doing. Uh, we have a lot of people, of course, doing stuff there, uh, but the original idea came, as I was saying, from talking to Lina, this artist who is very interested in biomaterials. And since they had space in there, studio, it was a great opportunity to actually have a physical place. It is actually one of the very, very few. We do not have a lot of these places in Brazil, um, if you don't, even though it is a big country. We have some people interested in open science and even synthetic biology and, and stuff like that, but usually related to universities or institutes somehow. It's very uncommon to have uh, totally independent wet labs. Uh, so in this regard, we are trying to, you know, spread the word uh, about community bio. Uh, so this is pr pretty much it. We have a lot of very few spaces like this in, in Brazil. Uh, most labs are still very attached to academia or companies or uh, research institutions. And then um, to share with you a little bit of our experiences, we have done different projects. I guess uh, one of the most interesting uh, ones is microbiology for artists. So you see there's a lot of bio art uh, from the very beginning of this whole thing. So back in 2019, before the pandemics and everything, we put together this series of uh, workshops. And then our idea was like, why not teach artists how to use microorganisms as a platform for artistic creation? And then we started the whole thing, uh, inviting people in, in social network, like 
do you know what penicillin have to do with watercolor? And then a lot of artists started, you know, showing up like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, but I mean, I, I know it's, you're talking about microbiology and you're proposing this series of encounters and I want to be there. So we put together this group. Uh, the answer, of course, for this question is that Fleming, the you know, iconic discoverer of penicillin, uh, also flirted with art. And then this was the whole thing, this art and science connection that we were trying to use to attract people. Uh, but this was only like the, the catch. Uh, from that, we put together people who were interested in, in being part of this group. And we discussed so many different things. All of the participants were artists, women artists, by the way. And then we had so many interesting uh, conversations regarding very basic and not so basic concepts from genetics, molecular biology, microbiology. And as we have the laboratory, we were able to perform stuff. Um, and, you know, the whole thing was like putting together this little program to teach artists who had no idea what microbiology was about and teaching them the very basics. So what is a culture media? What is plating? What are strains? What, you know, what is even DNA or stuff like that? It was quite interesting, and as most, I mean, all the participants were female, we finished this series of encounters with this artwork that we called Artists Vaginas because we did discuss a lot about microbiome. And then they were like, wow, this is, uh, for some of them, the, the very idea that we have bacteria colonizing every single square millimeter of our bodies was like astonishing. So they were like, why don't we do something with this? And then as we discussed a lot about uh, intimate microbiome and uh, techniques to isolate and sequence and metagenomics and how do we know these bacteria and how what do we do with this information? Uh, we put together this thing in, in the format of uh, uh, a visual work uh, and these artists incubated uh, samples from their intimate microbiota to take pictures. And of course there were photographers. So the pictures were are like amazing. I mean, I love these pictures, but this is only to give you an example of uh, how this collaboration between artists and science and scientists is at the heart of this little space that we have here. Uh, we have done some work with open science hardware as well. Uh, here in Brazil, we do have a, a, uh, an, a very big institution called SESC dedicated to arts and culture. And we established a collaboration with them to teach a series of workshops, uh, teaching people how to build these very simple microscopes, uh, how to analyze like cheek samples as Rachel was saying before, uh, that reminded me of these workshops. Very basic things that yet were able to bring people's attention to these tools and to this kind of thing. Uh, so we have been establishing some uh, collaborations with these spaces. Uh, just some more pictures so you have an idea of uh, some of this, the, the things that we have been doing. Uh, we did have a lot of plans, which uh, didn't necessarily happen during last year because of the pandemics. Uh, but one other thing that we did was putting together this artistic residency, this bio-artistic residency online, of course, but we were able to uh, collaborate around the theme of virus and pandemics. And at the end of this artistic residency, we uh, we put together a website, which I can share with you later if you're interested, uh, with the artworks that resulted from this more of speculative discussions. But the whole idea was, again, bringing together concepts from biology and microbiology and genetics and, and stuff with art and visual arts, design, philosophy, and, and other fields of inquiry. Um, BioLilo ha Lab has had a company incubated, which is called Visto Bio. Uh, they, some of these, the people in these pictures uh, are members of this company. They incubated there for a little while. They were developing formulas for um, natural formulas. They were able to clean clothes without washing it, uh, eliminating old doors and uh, smell and stuff like that. They were incubated by a little lab for a little while. Uh, and other than that, some other specific projects on biomaterials and a collaboration with a company in Brazil uh, 
that is called BioEdTech, which is working in 3D bioprinting. Since BioLittle Lab is inside this creative space, and a lot of people in this space have experience with 3D printing, BioLittle Lab has become also a bridge between 3D bioprinting and the 3D printing, and then artists and designers again interacting. Um, I guess that's pretty much it. Uh, we do have, I guess, more plans than we have actually produced stuff uh, other than these artistic projects and series of workshops and meetings. Uh, we do want to explore more uh, molecular biology and uh, potential applications from these. Uh, but then right now we are just trying to figure out how to navigate the online world. And that's pretty much it. Um, I guess that's it. I do hope it made sense. And I guess we will be taking questions, right? I don't know if that, that will be now. Yeah. But. Yes, thank you so much. Well, first I want thank to you. thank every, every one of you, every, so Beth, Eduardo, Scott, Stefan, Abigail, Rachel for just joining us and presenting, talking to us a bit about their space, their projects. Uh, and all, of course, every one of you for joining us tonight. Uh, I know it's a bit late. We have been here for more than an hour and a half, but I would like to ask if anyone has questions, either general questions or for a speaker in particular. Is the mic is yours. I'm curious how the different groups are handling sustainability in terms of, um, you know, uh, just being able to continue on. Um, so, you know, our lab is located in Vancouver, as I said before, and Vancouver is a very expensive city to actually live in. And uh, it's uh, a challenge, you know, I would love to actually have um, uh, you know, a separate space where we can have people come in, uh, you know, larger space, uh, but it's, it's actually really challenging to actually bring in some kind of um, funding to be able to support the lab in a stable way. So it's hard to say how much longer OSN will continue and the pandemic has certainly impacted us because, um, you know, we can't have people coming in. Uh, we expanded and then the province uh, basically shut down social events um, because of the pandemic. So I'm just curious how other labs around the world are engaging with sustainability and coronavirus. <laughs> I guess I could just say that um, part of the way we've been funded this last year is especially because of Jogo, right? We never could have gotten the uh, molecular biology reagents for corona detected without um, that support and trying to keep people doing things even though we're doing them virtually is um, the other thing we've been doing. So like, even though I was supposed to go to Columbia and said I did these three sort of virtual presentations and then that sort of got us a little honorarium, but I mean, it wasn't even a half a month of rent, but yeah. yeah. So, but the Jogo doesn't cover your rent. It just, it no. covers reagents. No, 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 so, we used all the money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so so how, how are you paying your rent? Yeah, so I, we, our member fees are very low, just 20 francs a month. And okay. um, so if we have 30 members paying, we basically can pay our rent. Okay, okay. Yeah, here um, roughly half, maybe a bit over half is actually um, being paid by a company that's um, uh, I do consulting work for. And so mm -hmm. I'm actually using the lab to actually engage. Uh, it's, so they're paying a corporate membership. So they're not actually paying rent per se, it just goes mm -hmm. into the general revenues. And um, 
uh, you know, we couldn't, we probably wouldn't have survived this long without support like that. And um, uh, so, yeah, I'm curious how the other spaces are, are doing with um, being able to survive, like BioMakeSpace. How is that going? I know you've merged with MakeSpace. Yeah, I guess I can take that because I think Abby has, has gone. <laughs> so, um, yeah, well, we're fortunate because we're in a university building. So um, we definitely would not be sustainable solely on individual member subscriptions, but combined with corporate member subscriptions, as in our old model and some grants, we were we were just about there because um, we don't pay much for rent. I mean, rent is the killer, right? So that's you're sort of struggling with in Vancouver as well. Um, but yeah, we recently merged with MakeSpace, which is um, helpful in the sense that a number of lab, of other bio labs are embedded in MakeSpaces, which have a broader appeal than a rather more niche bio focus. And so you can kind of spread a bit of the of the, of the risk and you've got effectively more, mem more members. So we, we, it does mean though that we've moved to the MakeSpace member model because now people have access to the MakeSpace and the bio MakeSpace other than those who are on kind of legacy biomics with membership. So, so in some cases for our corporate members, that's great because they actually, their, their cost of subscription has reduced, <laughs> but for everybody else it's doubled. Um, but it's 40 pounds a month, which is kind of the cost of a gym membership in the UK. Um, and that's, that makes space for a much larger group. So biomix space has had between sort of 20 and 30 members at any given time. And um, makes space has, well, 300 to 400 um, My main advice would be just do whatever you can to get the OPEX down. Um, and that meant for us hunting for a long time to be able to get space um, that effectively was rent free. <clears throat> oh, but, it, nice. but, it took a, but it took us years to secure it, but it, that's paid off. Um, so if yeah. anything, I would use the pandemic to start thinking about, well, what businesses are closing down? Uh, and I don't know how tax and business rates and stuff work in, in where you are, but obviously empty buildings cost the landlord money because they still have to pay taxes and maybe a not-for-profit in there might eliminate some of those taxes or you just pay them on their behalf or whatever. <clears throat> yeah, so yeah, try and be inventive in getting your office. Yeah. Is my, th <laughs> my thing. It, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. we, we, sorry. Sorry, a Vancouver right here. I'm just wondering, is there a reason why you're in Granville Island? Because not only are you in central, Vancouver, have you thought about moving to Surrey or Langley, where actually it might even be slightly more convenient well, uh, for public actually, transit? Actually, we're we're in Strathcona, not on Granville Island. Ah, so, sorry, um, okay, in Strathcona, okay. Yeah, yeah we're, we're actually in um, Vancouver, uh, Strathcona mm -hmm. is just bordering on the downtown east side, so there's yeah. a lot of industrial buildings that are um, it's one of the lower cost parts. Um, the challenge is, is that, you know, I'd love to be closer to one of the two main universities because there's like an infinite supply of undergraduates that want to um, do something in, in the community lab. Um, we're kind of too far from both of the universities, um, but also because it's the downtown east side, um, there's a perception of safety issues, um, particularly for women. Um, you know, it's a major, uh, I guess you could just Google Vancouver downtown east side. Um, uh, so there's some challenges. And yeah, we thought about going further out into the suburbs. Um, the challenge there is the commute for me, I guess, <laughs> uh, because I do work from the lab and, and um, uh, but I'm, I'm still open to ideas. You know, maybe if I lived out in the suburbs, then, then um, the lab being out there would be a little bit easier. Yeah, no, I was just thinking like a place like Surrey, for example, where you've got like, you've got the SFU Surrey campus, you've also got Kwatlen College there. And yeah. uh, 
so that might be, and then I assume my assumption is that the rent is cheaper, um, but the SkyTrain still goes to Surrey, you know, just trying yeah. to think of other ideas. But I understand it's far for you, so that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, and how do the labs handle consumables uh, in terms of if somebody wants to do a project, how do you engage um, or, you know, do you sell uh, tubes or do people get, um, uh, you know, uh, stuff um, that they can use like enzymes and things like that? I want to, I want to drop in here. Um, hello, I'm Mark. I'm kind of from this Hecteria network and we run a lab in Zurich in Switzerland. Um, I, I do think like if we have a problem paying the rent, then we have a real problem. I think rent would be the smallest problem. It's all the stuff that you just mentioned is consumables. It's also people like being paid to do the work in the lab. That is, I think, a much bigger issue than, than, than the rent. Like if you have troubles with the rent, whatever, Get a cheaper place or whatever find people paying the rent if we have a, a bunch of people paying the rent it will be easy even in a place like zurich or in vancouver to be able to cover it i think this is the smallest problem we have okay yeah definitely pay is um something you know uh we're also as a non-profit uh, so canada has two classes of non-profits is just general non-profits and then there are charitable non-profits uh the regulatory hurdle is to become a charitable non-profit where you can issue tax receipts and um that opens you up for a lot of um grants so that's a little bit more challenging so we're trying to work towards um uh, that you know, this year we're, we're aiming to try to get charitable status um, and that might allow us to um, actually have employees um, if we can get funding from sponsors and things like that. Hi, I was asking a question in the chat room. Uh, my main question is, there are many projects that are keep repeated in, in your talks and in the web pages. I uh, you know, usually browse like bioreactor, a shaking incubator, syringe pumps. Is there any way to avoid keep repeating them? Uh, because there are various designs, and sometimes they look like they are built from scratch again. So, do all these makerspaces speak to each other? Is there any common, you know, Slack channel or something like that, so that you know the knowledge can be shared across these makerspaces? I, I th there, are many, there, there are many networks. I think this is just one out of many. Huh? We can maybe like write down some of the discussion forums that, that I think many of us are involved. Yeah, I think uh, that's... Yes, you, well, um, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Go, you, no, no, go on, Adrian. Okay, so uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Um, I, I don't think that uh, very few people start from scratch like I, I'm, I'm guilty as a uh, as charge of starting the bioreactor but uh, uh, for sure we looked at all the other projects that existed including obviously Jenny's uh, project um, which also uh, I think uh, it used other projects in, in before uh, but I think it's it, it is a little bit of a duplication on, on some other projects and it'll be kind of interesting to have some I don't know, maybe a repository or verified projects of projects that still work and they are uh, they are, they are used uh, by uh, by the community. That that will be that will be very useful. Okay, I mean, if, if even if we leave the simple hardware, but now it seems that many bio spaces are having open trans. You know, just about discussing discussing the issues on open trans. You know, just on that one device is a very great value uh, across the makerspace. I think every one of you might be troubleshooting one bit or the other bit of the open trans. Uh, I don't know how each of you are communicating about it. Um, yeah, just interesting to know. So OpenTrons is actually um, starting up a forum. I'm not certain where they are at that yet, but um, you know, for, for that particular device, that might be a place where people can 
access once it's there. But um, yeah, it's basically I've connected out to people. You know, we only recently got ours in the middle of last year uh, as donated. And frankly, I, um, because we've been shut down from coronavirus, some um, people haven't explored it as optimally as they could. It also, um, uh, the pipettes are the only three, 30 to 300 microliter pipettes. So it doesn't have the smaller volume or the larger volumes. So that's something that we'd have to fundraise to get. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think um, for specific devices, there, there are often avenues that you can go and learn more about it. And there's also the Google groups. So there's the network of independence um, community labs, Google group uh, that uh, it's not particularly active now, but it used to be fairly active before. And there are a few Google groups like that, the DIY group. Okay, thank you very much. There is uh, some questions in the chat. For example, Dot uh, asked if you ever had to deal with any ethical issues at your lab and if there are any processes in place to deal with that. I think we all the time deal with ethical issues. That's why we have these labs, isn't it? I guess, yeah, I guess in, in my lab, um, maybe the biggest ethical, it's more about, um, you know, um, biosafety, biosecurity. Um, we had somebody bring in um, a human cell line, the HEK293s, and um, this was acquired from an, uh, a company south of the border um, where it's a, a risk group two um, because it's a human cell line. It hasn't been vetted um, for, you know, it's, it's biosafety level two. Uh, and although we have the equipment to be able to handle something like that, and I've got the training for that, um, um, we're not set up for it. So um, uh, it was a good conversation um, uh, to be able to get this person to understand, you know, what the challenges are of working with uh, things that could be risky to them or other people. Um, and, you know, uh, they, they actually uh, ended up getting a yeast infection so in the, uh, the culture, so they had to, to um, bleach it. But uh, yeah, um, it was a good instructional uh, piece. Well, opportunity. One time um, we decided to do the sort of um, spiral galaxy bacterial experiment where you, you get these environmental swarming bacteria. And if you do time lapses of them, they make these amazing patterns and you can see how each colony isn't necessarily starting from a single cell. Um, but when we did the experiment the first time here, we did the PCR and sequencing to see which swarmer we got, it turned out to be a potential human pathogen. <laughs> <laughs> and not the one that everybody um, from Fernand's lab and so on have looked at. And yeah, um, yeah so we just ended up killing it, right? <laughs> so, and we have some rules like you never grow a culture that's more than 500 mils. Um, you never, you're not supposed to culture like primary human tissues or whatever. Our cheeks, are, they, they go directly onto a slide and they, they dry down and everything and we stain them. But um, there's a, a lot of things for projects where if you wanna take an old project and hack it and redo it, then yeah, people are welcome to ask us for help. I and mean, this is going on to another question outside of the ethics and the biosafety stuff. So um, collaborating has been like, the huge um, enlightening thing to see how during the pandemic with some of these people I, I never met in person like Scott or um, this guy Ellen who started GenSpace. I mean, we have weekly chats all the time <laughs> and we've, we've all learned from each other and, and got a lot of great experimental results in the end too. Okay. 
someone else uh does someone else has anyone anything else to say any yeah, question I, I have one question um i've been reading about uh, antibacterial uh, resistance um you know it's big going to be big pandemic thing and all because virus based pandemics there is um sometimes a blueprints available how to tackle it but i i've been reading that the funding for the antibacterial resistance things are going down so how can we address through these kind of you know networks is there any way we can leverage the uh, you know existing infrastructure in these maker spaces to deal with this I think it's a, an interesting idea. I think, it, um, you know, um, it might be challenging for community labs to kind of um, drive some of that. I know there are some academic labs that are engaging citizen science uh, in doing just that, you know, basically collecting samples and then um, so basically environmental sampling and then and sending it to them. And uh, I haven't really been active with those types of projects, uh, but um, there are things like that. Uh, but for a community lab, I think it depends on the resources that the labs have. Um, like as Rachel said, you know, environmental and sa um, uh, sampling has has its risks. Um, there are lots of um, uh, organisms that are um, pathogens in humans, and so yeah. Um, uh, QME labs have to be particularly careful about that. Uh, yeah. Maybe it might be another just one giant lab project. So the open antibiotic initiative or something. So in, in terms of governance and how um, decisions are made, for Aquarium, we're like um, a public service association. So we have like a committee and board meetings. They're supposed to be once a month. And it's like on Wednesday, it's our general assembly meeting that you have to have at least one of these once a year to be officially a Swiss association. I'll so, be there. Yay, Mark. <laughs> are you going to be a member again? <laughs> <laughs> I was and, never unsubscribed as a member. I just stopped paying. <laughs> and we've never really pushed to ask too much. But anyway, we have a more strict treasurer now, Mark. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so yeah, so decisions being made. There is no real ownership, um, except that we're, we're all part of this... Um, a cooperative that we made with two other associations to get this space. Actually, we have, we have a building. It's sort of like a clubhouse space with a few startups and a couple of um, like Octanis that is an association that actually started as a Hackerian project with a sort of um, with kids from the EPFL, uh, lots of electronic sevens. So that's what the three D um, printer that I used for the open flexure microscope. System of tennis. And then we have another group called Polymaker that has all the stuff for like working with metal and wood and things. So, resolution of conflicts is sometimes difficult. <laughs> yeah, and here in Vancouver, um, we're legally obligated to have a, a board, but there's no instructions on how frequently. Um, we do meetings and uh, earlier on we were pretty slack. Everybody got so busy, uh, but I'm trying to institute a once a month board meeting uh, this year so that we can start to uh, meet some of the goals that uh, we had in the past. Um, and you know that's starting out uh, to, to work pretty well. Uh, within the lab, I guess I'm the, the um, the biosafety officer and overseer since um, it's part of that weird catch 22 that we have with maker labs is that um, if there's going to be an event here somebody who's also a member of maker labs 
has to be present. And so I'm that person. Um, uh, so I'm present for a lot of the events that are here uh, and, uh, and provide oversight and comment. But, you know, I let people do, you know, engage the way that they want. And um, so uh, uh, we've got one fellow who uh, is, um, he, he basically has um, uh, inborn um, metabolic error. Uh, he's had his genome sequenced and he's explored it and he's identified a candidate for what's causing his, his health problems. And so, um, uh, you know, we've talked about the biosafety aspects of him uh, exploring that and the types of works that he can do. Um, uh, and, you know, I always try to be encouraging you know, anybody that wants to get stuck into molecular biology, I, I'm all there for it. You know, I help them in whatever way they can. Um, and, and so, you know, things like that, you know, I, I just want people to uh, be safe um, and really just to learn and have fun. So any last questions or can we um, wrap it up? No. Okay, so yeah, thank you so much for joining us tonight or this afternoon, depending on where you are question. in the world. Okay. Yeah. I have an announcement. So this is a nice group. Thanks for putting us together, whoever did this. And I also looked at the, the image of the the meetup group, it only showed half of the world, huh? Because we're looking at the planet that has another side. And I'm, I'm involved also in the Asian group. So there is another kind of active group with also another hundred members with like connecting biomaker spaces in Asia, if anybody is interested, huh? And I think I invited some of them over. I don't know if anybody's here. No, it, yeah, unfortunately, there's no one else, uh, no one from Asia jo joining us. Yeah, so tonight. there is kind of a Facebook Hopefully group, next time. A WhatsApp group, there's a Google documents about kind of organizing a more like Asian focused kind of biomaker space meetings. And it, we have regular chats on a, on a WhatsApp group. So I try to connect it to this group as well. Great. Oh yeah, thank you so much, everyone. You're free to stay in the, the main room. Um, I just wanna say that our next event is gonna be from concept to market in biotech. So I hope to see you all there. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the speakers. I think at the, at anyone who wants to be involved in the, making plans for our next event, you can stay behind and we're gonna bring into breakout rooms now. So all the, all, all everyone helping out with the biology club. So thank you.